Okay, any questions? Yeah. Uh, just wondering, what part of the integrated part of business? They are lumped with assignments, so it's a twenty percent uh, distributed over. I'm planning on nine assignments and three quizzes. Okay, so it'll be distributed over that. So I was going to take you through something called uh, on Moodle. I have put something called current standing, and if you open that, it's basically an Excel spreadsheet where I keep track of your marks, and uh, I cannot reveal your name or ID. So. I, I need a mechanism for you to know what your mark is. One mechanism is you know what marks you got in assignment, so you can probably match and guess, okay, I got this much in assignment, this much in quiz, that must be me. Or if you want um, any other mechanism, you give me a, uh, some sort of a keyword, I can put that in. And do you guys use Clicker? Some of you do. Do you have a code that goes with the clicker? Yes. I, I, if you want me to use that, you give it to me, I'll put it on the spreadsheet so that you know what your marks are. Basically what I'm going to do throughout the term is um, give you your position. So this will be sorted from the marks. In this case, for example, assignment one is out of 100, quiz is out of 25, okay? And these are not sorted on assignments, but on the total weight. So right now I have only an assignment and a quiz, okay? And this is the average out of 20, 19.6 is the highest, 18.6 next. So it's sorted that way. So if you are, I also give you the average at the bottom and the standard deviation, okay? The average, if you are in the average ballpark, you probably are going to end up getting a B for one standard deviation above the average, probably an A and one standard deviation below that probably a C and if you are far below then maybe a D okay so just a rough guide okay and uh, this course as I said at the beginning of the course will be curved so I will use some sort of a distribution to distribute uh, the grades with a goal to adjust the average for the whole class because I have a sense of how this class compares with previous class if I feel there are better students in this class compared to the previous one, the class average may be higher. That means more people may end up getting an A. So this is a feedback mechanism for you so that you know where you are and particularly those at the bottom of the course, you have to make some decisions to put extra effort to bring it up or take the course the next term or whatever that you decide. Okay. So this is available and I will be periodically updating it and I, all I need is a mechanism for you to identify you with a particular key, keyword or some code. So if you can give me that, send me by email or something, I will try to populate that uh, with this. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, <clears throat> the quiz is out of 25 and uh, the performance in the quiz was pretty good, uh, I guess compared to previous years. The average was 15, the maximum was 24, uh, <clears throat> the standard deviation was five. And uh, there are people who need help in MATLAB, okay? And that's basically a diagnostic kind of a test. So, and some people have approached me already and I'm willing to help, uh, whichever way that you want. Uh, we did have this online um, help session last Saturday. Unfortunately, only four people showed up. We spent nearly two hours and uh, I hope those four who showed up found it to be an interesting experience. It's an experiment. How did you guys feel, those four who attended? Was it useful, sync of your time? Very helpful. Very helpful? Okay. So how many of you don't know where to get there, how to get there? There is something called a virtual classroom. Here it is. Okay. So if you click on that, it's basically web-based. So it will open up your browser and link you to the virtual classroom. The speed was a bit slow because I was doing it from home that some students were at LSU and they felt it was reasonably fast. And if you, have, if you have a slow connection at home, you might and try to connect to this, you might find it to be a frustrating experience. Uh, but it does, I mean, I, I'm learning too, okay? And I enjoy learning these tools. And it was very useful because I could take control of a student's desktop and say, look at the program the way it was and then try to fix it and walk that person through how to diagnose the problem. So 
I have not recorded that session, but I've thought about recording those sessions and also putting it so that other people who cannot attend that may just listen to that or view that and uh, get some ideas. What I don't want, I guess, is um, if you send me a program by email and then say it doesn't work and I fix it and send it back to you, we lose an opportunity for learning. Okay. Now you have a program that didn't work and you get an email back and a program that works, but you don't know what made it work. Okay. I think this interaction is an important part of learning. Okay. So you're, I'm available in my office, but if I'm not available in my office, I'm ready to do this uh, every weekend, uh, once a weekend, okay, for about two hours or so. So this Saturday also, I will make myself available uh, and I will see how that experiment goes. Uh, I am going to put an assignment uh, later today, assignment number three. Okay, uh, that will be more focused on uh, models. So I'll give you a variety of models and then formulate them. Some are linear equations, some are nonlinear equations. Uh, so, <clears throat> any questions, comments, feedback? Yeah. Which assignment? Oh, the one that I'm going to put will be due on uh, 20, let me see, 20, after the Mardi Gras. Is that fair? 23rd. Thursday after Monday? 23rd turns out to be probably a t Wednesday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Today, like right now, at 4 o'clock. When I say the assignment due date at 4 o'clock, uh, before that, you should send it. I'm willing to change this if you guys strongly feel. I know some of us have a physical chemistry test that day. 23rd? The, 20, the Thursday after Monica. Thursday after Monica. Okay. Uh, should I make it due Friday? What is Friday? 24th? 24th is fine. Okay, I'll change it to 24th. Um, remember, your test in this course is on 28th. Okay, would you like to have a quiz before that? <laughs> I will put the solution back as soon as the quiz is over, but the grades, I will try. I'll ask the TA to be able to, uh, if they can grade it in short time. So they don't forget it. Okay. Uh, okay, I don't need that. How is the pace of the course? Is it, what do you feel? Is it constant or is it increasing or is it decreasing or would you like it to change, increase or decrease? Silence means status quo is fine. <laughs> it's okay, nobody is having extreme difficulties or pressures. All right. <clears throat> so in the last lecture, we looked at uh, solving a nonlinear ordinary differential equation of the initial value type. Okay, and we're seeing a lot of these concepts. These are introductions to the concepts at this stage. Later on, these will be picked up in this, not only in this course but in other courses, and you will begin to appreciate them even more. But what you should know is what do we mean by a stiff ordinary differential equation? And that is equations, ordinary differential equations that have very rapid change in any variable, concentration, temperature, whatever it is, over a very short period of time. And then it relaxes for a long period of time. So whenever you have a separation of time scale like that, you will have that property. And when you have that property, the equation, the algorithm to use is ODE15S, not ODE45. Because ODE45 is good for other traditional types of ordinary differential equations, non stiff differential equations. And we saw how to time it. So we saw that ODE45 was 360 times slower than ODE15S on the same problem, the Van der Poel equation. 
Okay, and in the process, I'm introducing many features in MATLAB, and one of them that we saw was how to use the tick talk function to kind of time how much time MATLAB spends on a particular part of the algorithm solving something like that. Okay, and we also saw how to use subplots. Another feature that I introduced in MATLAB is how to put more than one uh, figure in the same page. Okay, that idea is so-called the subplot. Now, after I finish the linear and nonlinear algebraic equations, I gave you a set of reading assignments from the textbook. I am doing the same thing. Okay? Study these examples because in the midterm and the final and in assignments also, we will take examples from these. We won't have time to go through every one of them in the class, but we will take some additional examples because it is about mathematical modeling. So there are a lot of examples of ordinary differential equations, initial value problems in those sections. So you should make sure that you study them um, or at least be familiar with the problem before the exam. I'm going to start the next topic and that is going to be the next class of problems. So far, if you recall in this course, we started off with algebraic equations. Stage-wise separation as a model, we saw that can be formulated as a system of linear equations or a system of nonlinear equations. So we saw how to use the backslash operator, the invert operator, etc., to solve a linear equation. And the third assignment is going number of examples are of that type, where you assemble the matrix and use the uh, linear solver. And another set of problems. So it's the third assignment. There is really no new concept, but it's a reinforcement of what we have seen before: the linear and nonlinear algebraic equations. So how to use F sol? Okay, uh, there are some problems of that type. Then we moved on to ordinary differential equations of the initial value type. So to be able to recognize that it is an ordinary differential equation, it is a lumped dynamic model with initial conditions given at some time t equal to zero, and then ODE 4, 5, ODE 1, S, there are a whole class of algorithms like that, that will solve that class of problems. So pretty soon, within about five, six weeks, in this course, you have learned how to solve a whole range of problems. Okay, using a very powerful tool, tools in MATLAB. Now we are going to look at ordinary differential equations, but these are called boundary value problems. And this is also a distributed example of a distributed model, not a lumped model, but it is steady state. Okay, so we have a steady state, but a distributed model. So a new class of problems and a new set of tools to solve it in MATLAB. Okay, so the problem is the following. We have heat transfer through a fin. Okay, we're going to describe it in English what happens, and then we're trying to write the mathematical model, and then we start analyzing it, writing the code, etc. What is a fin? How many of you know? You all know what a fin is, right? If you have ever opened uh, a computer, you will see that there are heat sinks on the CPU. Okay, so these are called extended surfaces. Of course, nowadays you don't see in these modern buildings, you have air conditioning. But in the older buildings, you will have heaters. In older homes, even now, you may have heaters. Okay, And these heaters have what they call extended surfaces or fins. The idea is to provide as much surface as you need to dissipate the heat for many pur purposes. In a room heating, you want to transfer the heat that comes from the steam, for example, into the room. In the case of a car, it is to dissipate the heat that the engine creates. Okay, So you actually have a convective mechanism for cooling, which is a coolant, but you also have some extended surfaces. The larger the surface you have, exposed surface, the more heat you can transfer. And you'll understand why that is when you write the mathematical model. Okay, So this is an example of a simple fin that is attached to a base, and the base is at a very high temperature. So this block that you see here is at a temperature of T0. It could be 120 degrees. It could represent the top of a central processing unit on a computer, or it could represent the engine block, for example, at uh, 500 degrees, 400 degrees, or whatever. So it is a very high temperature. T0 is a very high temperature. Okay. Now, from that surface, of course, heat will dissipate to the surroundings because of the temperature gradient. It's, that's the nature of uh, heat. But we want to increase that rate of heat transfer to a higher value. So what we do is we build this extended surface. okay, And the purpose of the extended surface is to take heat from the base and conduct it by conduction mechanism okay, through a solid. 
And once this part is heated, the entire fin length will have a temperature distribution. It will be heated. And then you can dissipate the heat to the surroundings from that surface. Okay. So you could have many, many configurations. Here I have a rectangular slab with a fin that has, actually has a varying thickness. You could have one with a constant thickness if you want, something like this. Oops. Okay. Um, the reason why we would want to have varying thickness is if these fins are put, for example, in a rocket, you want to make sure that you don't unnecessarily overload with weight. You want to minimize the weight, but you want to maximize the heat transfer. So you can pose that as an optimization problem. Later on, perhaps you can look at that. But for now, we are going to allow the, for the fact that the area of the fin can be decreasing in the direction of conduction heat transfer. You can also have such fins on cylindrical geometries. So if you have a pipe that is carrying, and this is typically how it is used for home heating in the older uh, homes. Okay. Any questions on what the basic physical description of the problem is? An extended surface, a fin is a device that dissipates heat. It uses two mechanisms. One is conduction inside the fin. The other one is convection to the surrounding. And it is operating under steady state. Now, you could also consider this as an unsteady state problem. When would that be useful? For example, the car initially is at ambient condition. You are starting it. So the engine is going to heat up and then the heat transfer is going to take place. So if you are interested in questions like how long does it take for the fin temperature to reach a certain value, then you should pose it as an unsteady state distributed model. But in this case, it's a steady state model, meaning this fin is operating under steady state condition. The base has been at a temperature of T0 for a long period of time. So if I measure the temperature at any particular point, it doesn't change with time. Okay, that's what steady state means. But distributed means the temperature changes from point to point. Okay, So if I measure the temperature at the base of the fin or at the tip of the fin, I will get two different readings. Okay, Why? Because the heat is conducted from here, but some of it is lost. And then what is remaining is conducted here, some more of it is lost. So the temperature at the tip is going to be, what do you think, will it be hotter or cooler? It will be cooler, right? So that is what our job is. Our job is to predict the temperature as a function of length, where length is measured from the base of the fin to the tip of the fin. Okay. So, T is the dependent variable, temperature is the dependent variable, and X is the independent variable, position variable. Okay. So, that is space and this is a distributed steady state model. We are going to end up with a distributed steady state model. Now, okay. how do I write the energy balance on such a system? This, this idea is from your 2171. We have seen how to write energy balances, right? But this is going to be an energy balance that results in a differential equation. So you may not have seen this uh, precisely. What I've done is I've taken a small sample that you see here in a circle and blown it up so that we can make the energy balance in data and for a differential volume, control volume. Okay. The idea of a control volume is familiar to you, right? So when I write the energy balance, it's going to be rate of accumulation of energy equals rate in into the control volume minus rate out plus rate of generation. That is the principle of conservation of energy that stated in plain English. Now we have to introduce symbols and convert that into a mathematical framework. Now, you might have a catalyst in a reactor where the heat of reaction generates some heat. Okay, So that is why we are allowing for all these steps. But in this particular case, it's a fin. There is no mechanism for it to generate heat. In a nuclear reactor, for example, a fusion reaction, there is a source of energy that is being created. Okay, So in, in, uh, then, uh, if you are interested in predicting the temperature distribution in a nuclear fuel rod, you must account for what is the rate of generation by the nuclear uh, fusion mechanism or a heat of reaction mechanism. In this case, it's going to be zero. The rate of accumulation is also going to be zero because it is a steady state. So all I have is zero equals rate in minus rate out. Our task, yeah, sorry. What about rate of consumption? Good question. What about rate of consumption? Um, 
let's think about it. What is the difference between rate of generation and rate of consumption? They're opposites. They're opposites. It's a sign difference. So instead of putting plus, I could put a minus there. That's all I need to do. Okay. So when I say rate of generation, it actually means both source and sink. Now, when can you have a rate of consumption? If you have a endothermic reaction. Okay, the reaction that consumes heat instead of producing heat. Combustion is an exothermic reaction. Okay, but, but there are reactions that actually need heat for the reaction to proceed forward. You would have seen that in physical chemistry, right? So that's a good question. What about rate of consumption? Rate of consumption and generation are the same thing with a negative sign. So we handle that with a negative negative expression there. Okay, so there is no new term that is needed. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so what are the rate? Now remember, our control volume is this shaded area that you see here. This actually, if you can see the figure, it's going to be a volume that looks like that on the fin. So I have cut a small <laughs> section from the fin and I'm looking at it from this side. And that's what I see. So from the left, I have heat conduction into the control volume. From the right, I have, this is heat conduction into the control volume. This is heat conduction out of the control volume. And this is convection, that is heat transfer to the air. So on the left side, it is from solid to solid, what comes into the control volume. On the right hand side, again, from solid to solid, what leaves that control volume. So both are essentially the same mechanism, but they take place at two different locations, the left side boundary and the right side boundary. Okay? And then through the top and the bottom, I have heat transfer by convection to the air. And I want to maximize that. That's basically my goal. Okay? <coughs> So I need to quantitatively express, I have identified what are the mechanisms, what are the transfers in and out, I need to now express them in symbolic form. Unfortunately, you, you will see this only when you do the heat and mass transfer course later on. So I'm going to give you the expression that you need to take it for granted and you will see uh, maybe why that is and uh, why that has a particular form in that course. Okay? So zero equals rate at which heat is coming in from the left boundary. Okay, So this I'm going to represent by the symbol Q. Q stands for heat flux. It has the units of <coughs> joules per second meter square or watts per meter square. How much of energy is going every second per unit area through the surface. Remember, this is a surface because it has a depth. Okay, so I'm looking at these surfaces and the one on the other side. So that Q is the heat flux which says how fast heat is being entered into that surface area per unit time. Okay, that you can look at the units and you can understand the meaning behind that symbol Q. So I need to multiply that by A, the cross-sectional area, so that I calculate only the energy transfer rate because what I need is a rate in. Okay? So this is evaluated at what I call x. The subscript x indicates that this is occurring at a distance x from the base. Remember the heat flux, the temperatures are all functions of positions. This is a distributed problem. Okay? So this symbol represents how much of heat is entering through the surface that is labeled at x. And this thickness of this control volume, I'm going to call it as delta x. I'm taking a very small differential volume. Have you seen this kind of balances in any of the courses before? No? Okay. So let me take it slow. And if you have questions, please do stop and ask me. Okay. So I'm taking a very small differential thickness from the entire length of the fin. And I designate that length as delta x. And then I, I have a face on the left side, a face on the right side, and I'm trying to identify how much of it is getting in, how much of it is getting out. Okay, that is the rate in. Minus what is the rate out on the other surface. It's going to be a similar expression, Q times A, but evaluated at X plus delta X. Okay. So that tells me how much of heat has entered from the left 
minus what of how much of heat is left from the right phase of that control volume. I still have heat leaving from the top and bottom surfaces. Okay, and that I said is by convection mechanism. Okay, and there we need to model that by an expression that has h times the surface area. Let me call that as a s times t minus t infinity. Okay, that will have the units of again joules per second. This entire expression should have the units of joules per second. Every term in that heat balance equation is energy rate, which must have joules per second. Okay. Now, A s stands for the surface area. What surface area? The surface area in the top and the surface area in the bottom surface. Okay. And that surface can be given in terms of the perimeter times delta x. So, P, so this is the idea of taking a concept, conce conceptual statement into mathematical language. So, we are introducing symbols. As we introduce symbols, we must define every symbol that we are introducing. Okay? So, P is called the perimeter. That is, what is the length along the top and the length along the bottom? So, that length multiplied by delta x will give you what? The area of the shaded top and bottom surface. So, P is the perimeter going around both top and the bottom. Okay? That multiplied by delta x gives you the exposed surface area in the top and the bottom through which heat is being convected away. Okay? So, A s is given by P times delta x. P is the perimeter. Delta x is the thickness of the slab that we have chosen. Okay? So, that expression then H times A s times. Now, T minus T infinity simply says what is the temperature at that particular point T and what is the temperature in the surrounding? This idea is the same as we have seen in the cooling of the molten metal. What is the heat transfer to the surrounding? It is a heat transfer coefficient times the area times the temperature difference. Okay? In this case, the temperature difference is using the local temperature T and the T infinity, which is the surrounding temperature. Okay? So, T infinity is the surrounding temperature all around, top, bottom, at the tip, etc. So, that expression goes here, H times P times delta X times T minus T infinity. This is an important step. Whenever you do mathematical modeling, that is the most important step because that translates what is in your mind as a concept into an equation. Once you have done that, you can analyze the equation, you can design the fin, you can do a lot of things. Okay? But this one is from your mind onto a paper and then it can go into a program. Any questions on any part of that equation? Yeah. What is H? H is called the heat transfer coefficient. It's a parameter in the problem that is typically measured or obtained some in some experimental way. And it is affected by things like what is happening in the environment. If I have a fan, for example, the heat transfer coefficient will be high because I'm able to transfer more heat through that. And typically these, you should open up a computer and see, it's really a fascinating thing. You will see a CPU on top of that, you will see a fan and then a fan that is mounted on the top of the fan because the fin alone is not sufficient to dissipate the heat. It produces so much of heat and the fan helps increase that heat transfer coefficient if you like. Okay. So any other questions? Now the mathematics starts. Okay. We are going to now manipulate it and try to completely formulate the problem and understand what the problem is telling us. So the first thing I'm going to do is divide every term by delta x. Okay, so when I divide the first two terms, I'm going to write them as QA at X plus delta X minus QA at X divided by delta X minus HP. I have delta X in the numerator. So when I divide that, I lose the delta X T minus T infinity. That's purely an algebraic manipulation. All I've done is what have I done? 
I have switched the first two terms. I wrote QA x plus delta x first minus QA and x, but I flipped the sign in the front. Okay, So I have a sign change and I switched these two terms. And then I divided by delta x. Why do you think I'm, I would want to do that? Calculus. What do you know from calculus for that expression that I have as delta x goes to 0, as I keep decreasing the thickness? Yeah. Forgotten some of the very fundamental thing you learned in calculus. A -A -X, A -Q -A, uh, at x minus q a of x now give you zero. Will it give you zero? That's a good, good good question. Okay, let's review calculus now. Okay, calculus tell what does calculus tell you? What did calculus teach you? What did you learn from calculus? One single thing. Calculus was invented by Newton. It didn't exist before that. It's man's creation, right? <laughs> but we created it so that we can formulate the problems in a certain way, in a general way. Okay. So <clears throat> it is about rate of change of things. Anything in nature, if things are changing, we want to <coughs> capture how fast they are changing. And that's what this is. So your point is, which is a good point, in the limit of delta x going to zero, when I take the difference between q a at x plus delta x minus q a at x, you can ask the question, don't they become the same? So should I not get zero? Of course you should get zero in the numerator. But what happens to the denominator? Denominator, denominator also goes to zero, right? So you have a zero by zero. But that is what we call the derivative. Do you remember from calculus, the limit process? If I say, let me just draw some graphs. This is a digression, but if I have f of x, some function f of x, f of x in our case would be q times a, okay, as a function of x. I have a function like this, and I take two points that are very close to each other, delta x, okay, and this is the function, this is the function at x plus delta x, this is the function at x. So if I ask the question, what is the f of x plus delta x minus f of x divided by delta x, in the limit delta x goes to 0, I know you know your memory is <laughs> coming back. What is that? That is your bf dx. Okay. So what is happening is you have this small triangle there, right? As this point approaches that point, the difference in the <laughs> y-axis, which is f of x plus delta x minus f of x goes to 0, but the difference in the x-axis also goes to 0. Okay, But what is that division, f of x plus delta x divided by f of x? This is this distance divided by this distance, right? And what is that? That is the slope. So even though the function in the numerator goes to 0 and in the denominator goes to 0, that slope essentially remains the constant. So that is the slope at that particular point. If you draw a tangent, that derivative is nothing but the tangent at that point. So this is a way of calculating rate of change of that function, the slope of the function, how fast the function is changing if you change x. Right? You remember from calculus? That's exactly what we need. Okay, so I need to erase all of this so that I have space. So using that concept of a limit process as delta x goes to zero, what is going to happen is the left hand side is going to become minus d dx of q times a minus h p times t minus t infinity. Okay. Now, in that particular problem, now we need to start analyzing what are the knowns, what are the unknowns, what am I solving for? We started off by saying, I want to solve for t as a function of x. 
That's the only thing I'm interested in solving. Okay, but here I have a, I have q. Q has to be replaced by temperature. Okay, so this is something called the Fourier's law. of convection. Have you seen that in any physics course? Fourier's law of heat convection? Okay. You will see that in uh, when you go to the heat and mass transfer course. Uh, it basically says it's an empirical statement. Okay. So people observe the cooling rate through solids and then Fourier came up with this law which says that the heat flux is proportional to the gradient of the temperature. So in the general form you will state it something like this. Q equals minus K gradient of T. Okay, that basically means how fast the temperature is changing. If the temperature gradient is high, the heat flux is going to be high. In one dimensional case, you will write it as Q is equal to minus K times dT dx. As I said, this is an empirical model. Empirical model meaning we people do experiments, try to measure the heat flux and the temperature gradient and say this is proportionality constant is called the thermal conductivity material property that is dependent on that. So using the Fourier's law, we can get rid of Q. So you can write this as, and this is a minus sign. The minus sign indicates that the heat goes in the direction of decreasing temperature. So dt dx will always be negative, and so the other negative sign makes it positive, so Q is going to be positive. The heat flux has a direction, it's going to go in the direction of decreasing temperature inside a solid. Okay. So that I can then, the minus sign and minus sign will cancel. I will get d dx of k times a times dt dx minus hp times t minus t infinity. That is my model. In that model, I have k as a property of the fin material. If it is copper, it's going to have good conductivity. If it is ceramic, it's going to have poor conductivity, for example. Okay. And A is the design that I'm going to do. I'm going to assume how does the fin, the fin thickness change. H is the heat transfer coefficient that I know from experiments. P is the parameter I can measure. Again, it's a design parameter. T infinity is the ambient temperature. That's also known. So the only unknown in this equation is T that appears in two places. The independent variable is X. You are jumping ahead. I was going to ask you the next question. Is it linear or nonlinear? Is it linear or nonlinear? It's linear. Why is it linear? Because uh, there are no two uh, variables being multiplied by each other. Right. When can you have a nonlinear model for the fin? For example, yeah, question. Okay, good. Go ahead. T infinity is not a constant, you mean? Yeah, T infinity is not a constant. It could be, but can you make it a function of T? If you make it a function of T, then you will have a nonlinear. It could be a nonlinear expression. But you are on the right track. Uh, when you have radiant heat transfer, there are three mechanisms fundamentally for heat transfer. One is called conduction, which occurs in solids. The other one is called convection, when you have flow, like a fan. So we have actually both conduction and convection in this particular problem. We are trying to balance these two. But radiation is another mechanism. That is how we actually receive all the energy on the planet from sun. Okay? It is radiant energy. And radiant energy <laughs> flux turns out to be proportional to t to the power 4. Again, that's an observation. right? So if you have radiant energy in the problem, that will make it immediately nonlinear. Okay? Uh, so if the fin is really at a very hot temperature, for example, 200, 300 degrees, then you may have to consider radiant energy, in which case uh, you will have an additional term for heat loss, not only convection, but radiation. That will make it as a t to the power 4 minus t infinity to the power 4, for example. Uh, <clears throat> so we know this problem is linear because there is no nonlinearity in the variable t. Okay, And it's an ordinary differential equation. Why, why do we call it an ordinary differential equation? Have you seen partial differential equations? You have. Okay. What makes this an ordinary differential equation? You're smiling. Why? <laughs> <laughs> there is only one independent variable. So in the previous types of models we saw, we had only one independent variable that was time. That was also an ordinary differential equation, but it was a 
dynamic model and the conditions were all given at one time. Now in this case, this is an ordinary differential equation with a spatial variation in x, only one dimension. Okay? So if I have a fin that has weird shapes where the temperature is changing not only in the x direction, okay, but also in the y direction or the z direction, then I will have a partial differential equation. The same idea I will apply, but I will end up with a partial differential equation. So in this course, we won't go that far. We'll just stick to ordinary differential equations at the most. Okay. Now, what is the order of this differential equation? You think it's first? It's second. So the previous example that we saw were all first order differential equations. Now I have a second order linear ordinary differential equation. The order is determined by the highest order expression. Here this term has d dx operating on the d, 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 d dx. If k is constant, if a is constant, what can I do? I can take this term outside of the derivative. Then I will have d squared t dx squared. So you can much more easily see that it is indeed a second order ordinary differential equation. Okay. So th this is the final form of the equation. So a second order equation, you have all done differential equations course, right? If you are solving a second order linear equations, if I give you a piece of paper and say it's a quiz, go and solve it. How many of you can do it now? No. Okay. Let me ask you the other question. How many conditions do you need? When you integrate a second order equation, how many integration constants are you going to have? A second order equation will have two integration constants, right? The third order equation will have three integration constants, etc. So you need to find those integration constants from boundary conditions. Okay. So we need to come up with a set of boundary conditions. This is the difference why we call this a boundary value problem as opposed to an initial value problem that we saw earlier. Okay. So the boundary conditions are going to be given, for example, at the end of your domain, extreme ends of your domain. One is at x equal to zero, the base of the fin, which is hot, and you know the temperature T zero. When we describe the problem, that's how we started. We said the base of the fin is at a very high temperature, and the tip of the fin is at a room temperature. So at x equal to L, the length of the fin. So the length of the fin is also a parameter in the problem. Okay. H is a problem, P is a, a prime, H is a parameter, P is a parameter, K and A and L. These are all numbers that needs to be given before I can solve this particular problem. Okay. So it's a second order equation. So these are the two possible boundary conditions. It turns out that there is also a different type of boundary condition that you can give again at x equal to L. So at x equal to L, we have two options. One is to say that the tip of the fin is at room temperature. Okay. The other one is to say the tip of the fin is hot. Okay. But it is so thin that it doesn't lose much heat. How can it lose heat from the tip? By the temperature difference between the tip and the ambient multiplied by your heat transfer coefficient, for example, times the area. So if that area is small, that temperature loss through the tip is going to be zero. And so there are two possibilities. This is possibility A at x equal to L. This is possibility B at x equal to L. Either one of them. At the base of the fin, it always remains this boundary condition. So we need only two. So we're going to take the top one at the base. The, at the tip of the fin, you can take either one of those two conditions. And we will solve both of them. Uh, illustrate how to use both of them. Okay. Any questions? You might ask, why, why am I doing this? It's setting up such a complicated problem. As an engineer, what do I want to get out of this? And that is given in this expression. What does it allow you to do? If, if I know the temperature profile along the length of the fin, and of course, I'm given h and uh, p and t infinity. And if you ask me the question, OK, my uh, CPU is generating 20 watts per second. How much of heat can this fin transfer? Is that fin adequate? How many such fins do I need? Okay. To answer those questions, I should be able to calculate what is the total heat that you can transfer through that fin. And that is given by that expression, h times p times t infinity, tx minus t infinity. So in order to be able to evaluate that q, an engineering quantity, I need to be able to find out what the temperature profile is, and then I need to be able to integrate that. Okay. I can also get the same information from an alternate expression. They are exactly the same. Okay. 
You, I mean, they give you the same number, but there are two different ways of calculating it. This one, what does this one say? Let's see whether you can read and try to decipher what these symbols mean. The second part that I've circled in red, what do you think that might mean? It's always easy when somebody explains, right? But when you say, okay, go and do it by yourself, you need to think and you need to develop that uh, strength as well. It's like giving you a heat condition at whenever x is equal to zero. That's the first thing that you observe. That expression has something to do with x equal to zero because x equal to zero appears many places. So A at x equal to zero is the area of the base of the fin. So what we are doing in this particular expression is this is the base and the fin is like this. And what is the area? That is this times the length. Okay, and that expression is that evaluated at x equal to 0. What is the area? What does this expression do? We just saw that is the Fourier's law of heat conduction, which allows you to calculate the flux. That is how much of heat is leaving that particular area from the base that crosses into that fin. Question. Well, um, why the question is why is there a negative k? And the reason is heat always goes from high temperature to low temperature. So dt dx is going to be always negative. Okay, and the other negative sign makes the result positive, which says the flux, the flux is in the positive x direction, that is in the direction of temp decreasing temperature. Okay. So this entire expression allows you to, it's like a gatekeeper sitting in this plane and say, okay, how much of heat is transferring through that surface? Okay, so that is what this entire expression tells you. That's another way of calculating the total heat dissipated by the fan, because whatever heat that leaves the surface is eventually dissipated through the convection mechanism from the top and bottom surface. So the first part of the expression tells you how much of heat is dissipated to the top and bottom portion, right, convection, but that must balance what enters into that to the base, because that is what heat balance is about. Heat energy balances. So whatever that you put into the control volume goes out, but it goes out at different rates at different locations because the temperature is different. Okay, and that's why if you're going to evaluate it th through this expression, you need temperature as a function of x. Let me ask you this question. If I choose to evaluate it through this expression, the second expression, which is going to give me the same result, do I still need temperature as a function of x? You do because you need to calculate the derivative. So you need to be able to plot how does the temperature change with x. You don't care about temperature at other locations, but you need to calculate what is the slope there. So in order to calculate the slope, you need to know the function so that you can take the derivative of that function, t as a function of x. So both of them require you to solve this particular differential equation subject to these boundary conditions. Once you do that, you can use that to calculate the practical quantity, which is the amount of heat that is dissipated. Any questions? So this is the mathematical modeling part of the course where we are trying to develop the model, understand what the model is capable of doing. Now we need to prepare that for solution in MATLAB. Okay. So in an exam, I, I, I'm going to just give you these model equations and ask you to identify the nature of the equations. Okay, whether it is linear or nonlinear, lump or distributed, uh, what kind of tools would you use? Those kind of things I will probe and formulate it uh, for MATLAB. Now the next thing that we need to do, I don't know whether you have done this. Again, this is. Uh, uh, in, when you're doing it in computer programming languages, it is always nice to scale things up. Okay, So in this particular problem, right now I have t as the unknown. The question is, can I introduce dimensionless variables so that I form, reformulate the problem in terms of dimensionless groups? For example, I have too many parameters. I have k, I have a, I have h, and p, and l. 
Five parameters are there. So can I, can I somehow group them into one group so that when I get a solution, I generate one chart, one graph, and that graph can be used with any fin design as long as the design is of the particular shape. Okay, That's what Perry's handbook, the transfer handbooks will give you such charts for different types of fins so that we can calculate the fin efficiency and go about designing without worrying about solving this differential equation every time. And so what we are going to do here is define a new variable. This is just mathematical manipulation. There is no new concept in here. Okay, The concepts we have stated and we have developed a model. The model equations are in front of us. We are going to reformulate the problem in terms of dimensionless variables. This I would expect you to do in an exam. Okay, Given the raw model and then say do it, do a dimensional analysis, put it into dimensionless form. So in this case, I'm going to define theta as t minus t infinity divided by t0 minus t infinity. Remember, t is the unknown. That means theta is an unknown. Okay, But t infinity, t0 are all given. t0 is the base temperature, t infinity is the uh, tip temperature. So what would the range of theta be if I use that kind of a definition for theta? What are the range over which theta can change in this particular problem? Do you understand my question? Now, all I'm doing is I'm redefining a new variable theta in terms of all known variables. Okay, and one of them is t, the unknown. So theta becomes the new unknown. Okay, if I know theta, I can calculate t. So what is the range for t in this particular problem? The temperature. T naught and t infinity. Exactly. The t changes from t naught to t infinity. So when I put t naught in here, what am I going to get for theta? When I put t naught, I'll get 1. When I put t infinity, I'll get 0. Yeah. So the theta is scaled between 0 and 1. Okay. So the theta is going to a graph of theta versus the variable that we are going to look at is going to go between 0 and 1 on the y-axis. Okay. Now, if I give you such a graph, theta, then I say the t, t, t infinity is 200 degrees. I mean, uh, t0 is 200 degrees, t infinity is... 25 degrees, and I give you a theta of 0.5, will you be able to calculate t? You should be, because I've given you t infinity as 300, I've given, sorry, t0 as 300, t infinity as 25, <coughs> and I've given you theta as 0.5. So the only unknown is t. So you can solve for t. Okay. So we are making theta go nicely between 0 and 1. So we don't have to deal with very large numbers or very small numbers. That's the purpose of scaling. The other scale that we are going to introduce is in the x distance. x goes from what? From 0 to no. L. So we want that also to go from 0 to 1. So we define a new variable, Greek symbol psi, and this is defined as x over L. So the new variable is going to be psi, and it's going to go between 0 and 1. So the temperature profile can be like this, or it can be like this. We need to generate the temperature profile. Okay. Now, if I take that differential equation and introduce these variables, I'm going to get my differential equation in this form. Okay, So that is from this step, I get the differential equation to look like this if I introduce those two variables, two new variables, theta and psi. Okay? And what you notice is all the parameters have kind of grouped together to one number. Okay. So I, I just have to have a series of curves for each value of this group. I don't care what individually k is, h is, as long as the group has a certain value, I have a curve for that. I have a solution for that. How many of you can go from that step, the original equation here, to this equation using these two definitions? You want to take a try? Uh, theta is t minus t infinity over t naught minus t infinity. That would, it's basically saying dt over dx in that case. So you can substitute, um, so dt over dx now become d theta over dx. Exactly, exactly. That's what you're going to do. Okay? But I want to make sure that everybody sees that. Yeah? Where did you pay the angle? The k and a were assumed to be constant. Here k is constant, a is constant. So I take them out. That's the first thing that I do. Okay. So maybe let me just open up. 
I mean, obviously he has a clear idea of path, but how many of you need me to fill that intermediate step? You have to ask. Yeah. Okay. Let's do that. Um, Okay, so the, the problem was we had d dx of k a dt dx minus h p times t minus t infinity is equal to zero. First thing that we do is we assume k and a to be constant, so we take that out k a times d square t dx square minus h p times t minus t infinity equal to zero. That's the first step assuming k and a to be constant. Then what I'm going to do is, as he suggested, I'm going to write this as d square dx square. I'm going to write this as t minus t infinity. Can I do that? Because t infinity is a constant, when I take the derivative of that, what am I going to get? Zero, right? So this equation is the same as this equation, but I've introduced constant term and the derivative of which is going to be 0, so it's going to be the same. The next thing I want to do is divide by t0 minus t infinity. Again, that's a constant, so I can divide that inside the derivative, t0 minus t infinity, right? So divide every term by t0 minus t infinity and that introduces theta, okay? Because now this is the entire thing is theta. So I can write this as k a times d square theta d x square minus h p times theta equal to 0. Yeah? Why did I introduce this? Good question. Because t infinity is a constant and it is inside the derivative, right? So if I have, for example, d square t minus dx square minus d square t infinity dx square. That is the same as d square dx square t minus t infinity, right? Now d square t infinity over dx square is zero. You are not seeing the derivative in this one, right? Yeah. Yeah. But that I have not done anything. The t minus t infinity already exists in that term. The second term has t minus t infinity as it is in the model. So I have not done anything. So this is the model. This is the starting point. We derived this before. Okay. So the first manipulation I do is assume k and a to be constant. I take that. The second manipulation I do is. I write this t as t minus t infinity. Okay, this t as t minus t infinity. You can do that because this is what I've done. D square dx square t minus t infinity. When I had only t, I wrote it as t minus t infinity. Why can I do that? This is your challenge. Okay, because this is the same as I can split this up. D square t dx square minus d square t infinity dx square. These two are exactly the same. But d square t infinity d x square is equal to zero. Why? Because t infinity is a constant. So it is like adding zero to this. It doesn't do anything to the equation. Adding this term is like adding zero to that particular equation. You can always add zero to the left hand side or right hand side. The reason I do that in this particular form is now I can make this as equal to theta. But you're still not convinced. You are lost. Okay. How many of you still have issues with this manipulation? Let's go back to, um, let's take this expression. Okay. d square dx square t minus t infinity. How did I get this? This term is equal to zero. This term is equal to zero. Okay. So I can always add a zero to that equation. The reason I want to add it is because I want to get this in the form of a theta. 
maybe think about it if you have difficulty come to my office because uh, I think others are if there are a lot of people have problem please then I will, I will try to explain it one more time but if it's only few then we can move on and I can take care of that later is everybody okay with that okay so the next thing I need to do is very similar change to x because I have x squared I want to change that into psi squared so the definition I introduced is psi is equal to x over l. So you can separate that and write it as l times psi is equal to x. That is taking it to the left hand side. Remember l is a constant. So if I take the differential of that d of l psi is equal to dx. But l is a constant. Psi is not. So you can take this out. Exactly. L d, so this will tell you that L times d psi is equal to dx. So I, can, I have dx squared. So I can replace that by k times a times d squared theta. Wherever I have dx, I replace it by L times d psi. So L squared d psi squared minus hp times theta equal to 0. Now I collect all my constants. Okay, so I have d squared theta, d psi squared minus hp l squared divided by k a times theta is equal to zero. That is my transformed differential equation where everything is beautiful because theta will always be forced to go between zero and one and psi will always be forced to go between zero and one. And whatever the fin parameters are, they are all contained in one group. What will be the dimension of this group if we calculate the dimension of HP L square divided by KA? No, but that by, uh, it's a constant. It's going to be a constant. Every, every term in there is a constant. When I say dimension, is it going to be meter square? It's going to be heat flux. What are the units for that particular group? Everything else in the equation is unitless, right? So even though H will have a unit, K will have a unit, A will have a unit, you will find that that particular group is dimensionless. It has no units. And this is, uh, I don't know whether you have seen dimensionless numbers in other courses. You are doing fluids now? Fluid mechanics? Have you seen Reynolds number? H and K would essentially have the same unit because P times, well, L squared to cancel out EA. No, it's, it's a bit more complicated. You need to actually figure out, plug in all the numbers. Maybe if you want, you can do that. We know that H has the units of uh, watts per meter square degree C. K has the units of watt per meter degree C. Okay, And L will have the units of meter square and sorry meter and a will have the units of meter square so if you plug in all these into that expression you can see what what you will get so watt per meter square degree c multiplied by the perimeter perimeter should have the units of meter length square should have meter square divided by watt per meter degree c and area is meter square. Now you'll see that watt cancels out, degree C cancels out and you have meter square, meter square cancelling out leaving you meter. Here you have meter cancels with one meter and so the remaining will cancel out. So all the dimensions cancel out in that expression giving you a dimensionless group. Chemical engineers love dimensionless groups. The reason is once you have that group you can use that to design fin of one micrometer long or a fin of one meter long. It takes the, the same solution can be used to design fins of different length over different temperature ranges because just a mapping. Once I know the solution, I can go back and get what is the actual temperature in T and what is the actual length in L. And we will see how to do that in the, the MATLAB implementation of the solution. Okay, any questions? Yeah. Yeah. 
because I wanted to recognize that this whole thing is my theta, because that's how I introduce theta. Okay? And I can divide both terms of an expression by the same constant. Okay? So again, this entire thing becomes theta here. Okay. So this M is called the dimensionless group, which is H times P times L square over K A. And the equation becomes this. And we also need to transform the boundary conditions. Okay, when you transform the boundary condition, that's very simple. Okay, because you know that T is equal to T zero at X equal to zero. So when X equal to zero, what is sign? From the definition. When x equal to 0, psi is 0. So this becomes psi equal to 0. When t equal to t0, what happens to theta? You put t equal to t0, you have t0 minus t infinity divided by t0 minus t infinity, which is 1. So that is your first boundary condition. Okay? Theta at psi equal to 0 is 1. The second boundary condition was at x equal to L, t is equal to t infinity at x equal to L was the second one of the possibilities for the second condition. When you put t equal to t infinity, theta is 0. And what happens to psi? Psi will be 1. That's what this condition is. So our reformulated problem in terms of dimensionless variables is this equation subject to these boundary conditions. Question is it linear or nonlinear? Of course, it remains linear because we already seen that it was linear. Any questions? A little bit of heavy math, of course, but I hope you are keeping up with that. There is one last step before we have to go to MATLAB to be able to get a solution to this kind of problems. And there is a tool called BBP4C. Okay? Uh, it's basically stands for boundary value problem and 4C is a code just like ODE 15S different algorithms okay so here it uses some sort of a collocation algorithm of a fourth order we will see the theory behind it later on but we will need to learn how to use it to get a solution so initially we are seeing how to formulate a problem how to get a solution out of MATLAB or for, for the, that kind of a problem one of the things that we need to do we already saw that this is a second order ordinary differential equation MATLAB can handle only first order systems. Okay, <clears throat> So we have to be able to reformulate that and this will be part of an exam question. So I give you a third order equation and say prepare it for use a solution by BVP4C. So you need to be able to convert that third order equation to a system of three first order equations. They are equivalent, they are exactly the same thing but a trick that will get you there. Okay? Have you seen that kind of a trick in differential equation? The equivalence between a higher order differential equation and a system of first order equations. If I have a third order equation, I can write it as the same as three first order equations. If I have a fourth order, I can convert that into four first order. If I have a second order, I can convert that into two first order equations. And then, once you, you will see why we want to do that, because then it's just a matter of writing the two functions, and then MATLAB will take care of the rest. Okay? So how to convert a second order equation into a set of first order equations, in this case, two first order equations. It's a recipe. There is no magic to it. It's a recipe. You follow the recipe, you'll always be able to do that. A higher order system into a system of lower order, first order systems. The recipe starts like this. Theta is my unknown. I take that theta and call it, I'm going to now have a vector of equations. Two equations is a second, uh, second order, right? So I'll have two elements in that vector. So the first thing that I do is define theta to be a new variable y1. And then I define the derivative of theta to be the next variable y2. So instead of calling theta and d theta d psi, I'm just calling them as y1 and y2. So I have a vector y, which consists of two elements, y1 and y2. What is the meaning of y1? Same as theta. What is the meaning of y2? It's a derivative of theta with respect to psi. Okay. Now, I'm going to attempt to convert this equation into a set, equivalent set of two first order equations. These are definitions. Okay? You always start off with definitions. 
<coughs> so if I give you a third order equation, you will define one more variable y3 as the second derivative. Okay, that's where you would stop. You will stop one order less. <coughs> so here you have a second order equation. So I define the <coughs> function and the first derivative as y1 and y2. Then I'm going to formulate. Now I have two equa two variables, y1 and y2. I'm really interested only in y1 because y1 is the same as theta, but I have another equation, y2. So I need to find two equations to be able to solve those for those two variables. And I formulate these equations. How do I formulate these equations? I formulate them in such a way I solve the original problem. Okay. So I take, for example, the derivative of y1, dy1 d psi. y1 is something I defined. I can take its derivative with respect to psi. And I'm going to call that as the first function f1. Okay. But what is dy1 d psi? y1 is the same as theta. Right? So dy1 d psi is the same as d theta d psi. Follow the logic carefully. Okay. And but d theta d, d theta d psi is the same as y2. So I have the first equation which says dy1 d psi is equal to my first function, which is y2. A very simple function. That will be the first line of your function program that you are going to write. First function is y2. Okay. Now, what about the second one? <coughs> I take the derivative of the second equation, d, dy2 d psi. I'm going to call that as my f2, the second function. Okay. I'm going to call whatever that comes out. But what is dy2 d psi? Well, I know y2 is d theta d psi. So if I take its derivative, what am I going to get? dy2 d psi will be the same as d square theta d psi square. This is where I impose the original equation. So d square, th d square theta d psi square, I look at this original equation, it's the same as m theta. I move this to the right hand side, it's the same as m theta. So if I make my second function f2 as m theta, theta is the same as y1, m y1, I am solving the original problem. Okay, So the second equation becomes dy2 d psi as equal to m times y1. So if I solve those two equations in two variables y1 and y2, I would have solved my original problem and the solution will be saved in the vector y1, the element uh, y1 in that vector y. Any questions on that? Do you understand what happened? It's a recipe as I said. The recipe defines new variables and maybe I'll give you one other example with the third order problem. Okay, And you should be able to convert that into a set of three first order equations. But let me just pause and ask. Is that clear? What I did there? Silence means maybe not. <laughs> of course, I have. I'm not. I'm now going to forget the original equation that I had. I'm going to forget this equation because I have derived from that two equations that are equivalent to this. So I'm going to solve these two. Okay, that means I need to write two functions for the two variables y1 and y2 in MATLAB. But I also need some conditions, the boundary conditions. I need to transfer them. What are the boundary conditions? The original boundary condition was theta at psi equal to 0 was 1. But what is theta? Theta is the same as y1. So I have the condition y1 at psi equal to 0 is 1. The second condition was theta at psi equal to 1 is 0. And theta is still what? y1, right? So y1 at psi equal to 1 is equal to 0. So the two boundary conditions that I have are y1 at psi equal to 0 is 1, y1 at psi equal to 1 is 0. And now you should be able to see why we call this a boundary value problem. This equation looks very similar to the equations that you wrote. We have two first order equations, you have two conditions, right? Why can't I use ODE45? ODE45 would require both the conditions to be given at the same value of the independent variable. Independent variable would have been time, and you have to give both conditions 
at the same location for y1 and y2. Now why this is called the boundary condition is because these conditions are given at two locations of the independent variable. Okay, And that's why we call this as a boundary value problem. <coughs> Can you write that in vector form? Of course you can. And that is going to be going to define a vector y consisting of these two elements, y1 and y2. I'm going to define a function consisting of these two functions, f1 and f2. <coughs> okay. And then I can write the problem as dy d psi as equal to f. Okay. So what is f? The f is going to be equal to y2 and m times y1. Okay, And that's it. So the problem is now ready. We can start using MATLAB. We go to MATLAB and start solving this problem. But before I do that, I want to make sure that you understand this transformation. So I'm going to give you, so we're almost out of time. Maybe that's a good place to pause and uh, when you come back, I will give you a third order equation. We will work through that, how to convert it to a system of first order equations, and then let's go to MATLAB to solve this.